um, the Board of Governors of the post office to get rid of the, to get rid of um, Lovejoy or Detroit, whatever his name is. And so I just looked up um, a little bit more of the Board of Governors and it's supposed to be um, seven people and it can be no more than four people from any one party. And all the current, there are a total of six people on it now. And um, all of the current appointees have been appointed since 2018. So they were appointed by the current president and it's four Republicans and two Democrats. So I don't know, good luck with finding that as a point of leverage. But it, I mean, it really sounds like there has been um, an ongoing um, conspiracy or something to get this all in place. Yeah, the person, so the, also parts of the Board of Governors of the Post Office have different roles. And the person specifically who is over um, like free and fair elections, because they understand the role of the Post Office in elections, basically resigned this summer um, because he, he felt like, uh, you know, it was going to be a total hoax. So sometimes I wish people wouldn't resign, but it would actually just make a lot more noise. <laughs> I wonder, you know, there is this idea that a strategy to remove oneself from a situation. Um, and I just, I'm not always sure if boycotting or removing oneself from a situation, um, you know, it's not good enough just to be right. <laughs> you also have to be strategic. Yeah, it's kind of the other side of what Alondra was talking about, not throwing each other away. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, Alondra. Good evening. Um, I picked one problem out of my many when we started out. <laughs> and one of them was transportation, especially for medically fragile children in our, we live in a border part of our state here in Eau Claire, but it's right up to Minnesota. All of the most, all of the services that we can get from specialty physicians comes from Minnesota. However, our peer source is Wisconsin, and that creates a big problem right there. So the transportation issue for special needs children has been very difficult. Um, the, it, there is an assigned group uh, mandated by the state to be able to pay for, select, and uh, manage. And it's been really something to say the least. We had a big situation prior to the time that the webinar started. So using the de design statements and using um, the points of leverage that we had, I went ahead and found, um, put the word out. 64 different people came back with genuine complaints against this particular organization within the last 60 days. We took that all to the ombudsman in the state of Wisconsin and the ombudsman in the state of Wisconsin also was very upset with the situation. We ended up going to the governor's office we ended up going to the coalition for um, special needs children in the state of Minnesota that oversees it, who squashed it. And um, at that time, they, there was a lot of really bad contention. So me and my pious, quiet way went all the way to the Children's National Defense Fund and the federal government in Washington, DC. And <clears throat> right now, long story short, <clears throat> I have looked at a lot of these people as my enemies and as our enemies instead of collaborators. Within the systems, I was able to find one person to collaborate with in each one of those systems, no matter how negative, no matter how repulsive they were to work with, no matter what disgusting things that they said about not just caregivers of special needs children, but how they all shouldn't have been resuscitated in the first place. I had to really sidestep the emotions and the circle and the plan allowed me the ability to be able to feel that, but stay within it. So where that whole situation is, is now, is it suddenly there's an audit to that particular company that has, uh, uh, that provides that, though that transportation issue. And uh, the state is, has mentioned that they are unaware that there have been these problems, that they did not know that there were these problems, that they thought things were smooth because there's there's so many people in alignment there, there's so many instead of like having one person just figure the thing out there's multiple people 
So using the plan, we were able to make a lot of progress into that. And right now they're being audited and everything's being overseen. And the ombudsman is overseeing the, the entire company I mean, the, an ombudsman from the governor's office, which is who stamps it to pay, is overseeing the work there. Mm -hmm. until they bought out, should see what happens. Interesting. Yeah, I just want to lift up this, the idea that in every um, system, in every level of system, there's usually an outlier, and it's a good idea to find that person. <laughs> um, person. I want to welcome Alondria to the um, Ask a Practitioner. And Aaron had something come up for the first half. He's going to join us for the second half um, uh, and is happy to answer questions about his work then. Um, I wanted to give space for folks to, we, I feel like we just got started on Sunday as Alondria was presenting and speaking. And I just wanted to give space for folks to ask her questions or, or uh, Laundry, if you wanted to share some of the things we weren't able to get to, either way. Uh, all right, but I think we start with questions. Sure, that sounds great. Or commentary or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm going to cut another light on because it just got real dark. Hold on one second. Okay. So I had a question, this is Carol, um, and that was um, on one of your slides. Oh, hold on one second, hold up, hold on. I can't even, hold on, let me get back into uh, the position. Mm -hmm. Okay, now go, sorry. Okay, then you had one thing that said leverage versus power. Uh-huh. And I just wanted you to, to uh, if, if you would please talk to us a little bit about that, because that's what we've been talking about so far, and you got me thinking, so please. Would you? Yeah. Uh, on one second, I got to take a whole bunch of meds before I can eat dinner, and it's like eight thirty. My times so I just need to like take the cremolian sodium. Hold on, one minute. I'm so sorry. I got like a a schedule, and I get off of it every all day long. <laughs> so sorry. Okay, so uh, whew, it is a job just maintaining medicines. So um. So when I think about leverage versus power, um, and I wouldn't have probably said this like a year ago. I think, you know, I've been really like, well, I don't know. I've been wrestling with what it means to like think of people as enemy and as target for a really long time. Um, and also think about what it means to have power. Um, and I think part of it comes out of both, like I have a really pretty deep, uh, tantric yoga practice and meditation practice um, and I'm like a you you Christian I, like not really it's like I live in the deep south so you know you're gonna be influenced by stuff whether or not that's the um, number one path you follow um, but have really done for many years like started practicing and at like 14 dad my father uh, uh, ended up in Thailand during Vietnam right and live with these Buddhist monks and to him he was like that that understanding of like what it means to move through space and time, what it means to like have a radical framework in Marx's understanding of what shifts and change looks like, but within a practice of spiritual fortification and belief that like we are actually spiritually trying to transform the world we are in, not mentally, but like in our souls, means that you're not trying to actually have power over anybody else right? You may be trying to transform people to a different way of being. We may have leverage over decisions that are made, but I am not actually trying to overpower you in the sense that you lose power over your own agency and ways of being, right? So like, here's an example. So my father got the dementia, dear God, right? So like every day, all he can remember until it comes time that, oh, Elandria is sick and can't move and needs coffee or whatever. But like every day he says, you all took my stuff. You took my iPad, you took my computer, you took my phone. Now the man does not remember he gave away like thousands of dollars. He does not remember that like he like wants to talk to his friends in Jamaicans, which costs $237. Like he doesn't remember, he doesn't remember any of that. What he remembers is we took his power. 
didn't matter he was going to hit somebody driving and did three times, right? And so it like, and that was today, right? And so it reinforces to me when people feel like their power is taken, there's only one way to respond back, which is by aggression, right? And so instead, the question is like, how do we use the leverage we have to like help shift what we need to shift? How do we use the leverage we have to be like, I have, and then I think it also helps us see what do we have at our disposal? Because I'm like, if you do like a, a traditional, like a power chart or strategy chart, and you're like mapping out who can make ultimately what decision, it can get real depressing because you can't make no decision. Half the people you know can make no decision. And you're like, great, we can make no decision. But instead, if you're like, actually, but I have leverage here. Like I have people leverage in this spot. Like you were doing your story, right? Like I have people leverage here. This person over here knows this person, which can give me leverage in the door. This, and so then you actually are like broadening out your, the leverage points you've got, right? To really shift something and not like my job is to neutralize you. And so I think that to me is the difference. And the two, and then I actually think it gives us more, I think it gives us more like internal power and community power, right? And then I think it's like about, uh, like, and then I feel like people can also like see, so I, so like, I'm just gonna use like the UU stuff. An example, a lot of times people are like, we're gonna show up in yellow shirt. I'm like, that's cute and great. However, like y'all three are like managing a bank. You over here is a state senator. You over there, right? And so our church started really going, where do we have leverage? So now the mayor comes from my church, the like half the city council, half the whatever. And like, and so they're like really progressive people now in positionality that makes a major difference. And if we had just thought about the power we had, we can get stuck in, oh, we're not Christian. Oh, we don't have the Bible. Oh, but in the end, we actually had way more leverage than we ever thought possible. Right. I hope that makes some, I hope that makes sense. Um, I just think it's a very, I think it's a, a shift that's not necessarily like, uh, and so for me, it's not theoretical in the same way. I think people are like, oh, you're talking about words. And I'm like, no, I'm actually talking about like how we are actually moving things in reality and in practice. And I think if we're trying to craft things that are new and not just resist stuff, it's really important to also to think about like, what is the leverage we have that we can have at our disposal so that we can get procurement policies passed the way we want them so that we can get our people the things that they need to actually like start daycare centers, you know? And it's because that's actually not about like a, this, it's actually about how do we craft. And I think in the crafting, you actually need different language than you do if you're just going after a thing. I hope that makes, so, okay, that was a long, that was very long, I'm sorry. If anybody has any comments or thoughts, I would love to hear from y'all thoughts too, because I like to learn. Thank you. That was beautiful. Crafting instead of a fist. <laughs> I'm just thinking about, um, like, uh, it, like political discourse is so much right now about tearing each other down um, mm -hmm. and we're fighting really important fights and this this it's very difficult to um like to me it seems like what you're saying makes so much sense for how we do and it's like less and it's really hard to do for how we talk when we're like making public discourse for a particular um, fight. Yeah. <laughs> I'm saying fight, you know. I know, it's like um, we're, I we're, know. We're, okay. we're, we're, um, So yeah, it's hard to pull out and, and think about, um, you know, like we're trying to cancel rent and we're trying to yeah. get people to sign on to the bills and um, like, yeah, I guess we're using all kinds of leverage, but when people are really awful, then we're, <laughs> we try and expose that because we want them out, you know. Well, no, and I'm not saying not exposure. So I want you to, yeah. I mean, I was shot at by the IDF. I mean, let, let's be really clear. The reason I have asthma is because I drank natural gas and frack. I mean, no, 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 no. So I am not saying to not expose. Clearly, that is essential. I'm not even saying we don't have a fight on our hands. I think we do. 
Like, don't hear me say we're not. I actually think we're in deeply moral and spiritual warfare right now. But like, it's a, I mean, like I actually think it's what we're in. I think the question is how do we go at it? Mm-hmm. Right, so like, here's an example. So I, we're all over the age of 25. This is great. Most of you are older than me. So, and some of you are not. I don't know how old everybody is, but I'm looking at your faces and you've been around longer than me, most of you. So like, I'm watching people do some stuff within our movements that I have never seen before in my life. So like, here's an example. There's a thing called medium. People putting all the teeth, all this stuff, showing personnel files. Like, I'm like, what in the world just happened? Like, it's like, I am mad at you. I do not like the way that you were internally working. So guess what? I'm about to show stuff I'm not even legally liable to show, but I'm about to show it all. I don't care if it like messes up the org. This is how I'm gonna get you to resign. It's like, boom. So like how we are actually dealing with conflict internal to our movement was exactly like how we're dealing with conflict with like the Trumpster. There is actually no difference between how we deal with internal conflict and like the people were actually, that are actually causing us the primary problems, right? And so not that we don't have to deal with the foolishness inside our movements, but we are using the exact same tactics, right? So like two people get mad at each other in a town that's like got very little people in it. They're only 45 people really doing good organizing. They having a beef, somebody trying to come stab somebody. I'm like, what is happening? So like we're in a moment, and this happened in the civil rights movement too. People were throwing chairs at each other and everything. But like, I'm just saying we're like at a moment in which if the way that we, the only way we know how to shift stuff or to tackle stuff is the same internal as we do external, how would we ever like get to anything? Right. And so that I'm watching like straight up. It's really depressing actually. Right. And so because we don't know how to deal with conflict and because we don't know how to sit in contradictions and because we don't actually are not like, what is our ultimate victory? Really? Right. And like, we're, we critique everything to the point of like no return. And so like, do I like the person we got as the VP pick? Not particularly. Do I think they politics is great? Not necessarily, but like, let's be real. Like we all knew the Democratic National Party, DNC was not gonna choose somebody that was the most leftist, progressive person in the history of the world. That was not about to happen. So like, why get upset? I'm like, look at here. Like, it wasn't gonna happen. All we have to do now is do what we did not do when Obama was in office, which is push, push and push. And that's when the leverage thing comes in, right? Because we're not gonna take down Like, right, the reason why I think about it all the time, the reason Obama was allowed to, like, move the way he moved for years is because nobody wants to take down a black dude, right? Because we were like, oh, we don't want to take over you. We don't want to power over you. If we had instead been like, what is the leverage we have to move you so that we are not actually losing folks to deportations, so we are not doing whatever, then the language shifts, and then you're like, okay, so instead of us being like, we're going to take down Kamala Harris, which is asinine, or Biden, instead it's like, how do we use the leverage we have to shift you more left, right? So that your policies, your practices, your way of being is more left. So what is the shifting we have to do? And that's where the leverage really matters, right? Like how do we use leverage to shift? Who do we know that's in what positionality to put in your spot so that you actually are listening? Because we don't actually want you to not win, right? Like that is not, we do not want another four years of the Trump. So, right, like, so, and so I think that's to me, it's like, especially where it comes in where you're like, okay, we need to move you to a different place, but I'm not trying to like annihilate you and take you down. Also at the same time, cause then we're just gonna end up with another fool again for the next four years, right? And I think like that, so, and I think to me, it's literally like, and it doesn't mean we don't expose, you've had a horrible record around whatever, right? And so to actually be my vice president means you need to shift your record, like now, right? Like, and so it doesn't mean we're not saying you don't need to, this is what you've been like, you got some growth to do. Let's make some growth happen. Otherwise, we come in, right? And so I don't think it means not come. I, I believe in coming real hard. I just think it's a matter of like how you come, what you have at your disposal to come with, and then how we flank people once they get there and not try to tear them down too. Because we had great people at times, and then we were like, we're destroying them every moment, right? And we weren't flanking. And so I feel like that's our job is to flank. 
Like if we're not going to be in those positionalities, it's like, how do we flank? And part of that flanking is the exposure. Part of that flanking is the like constant push. So like everybody knows they on, uh, you know, they're on their own first base. So, you yeah, know, I'm down with you. I understand exactly what you mean, Louisa. Thank you. That's very helpful. I, there are so many different situations I'm thinking about while you're talking. <laughs> yeah. Just, just, to, just to leap off that, I'm wondering, Alondra, if you could talk about, maybe this isn't the word you would use, but I would use the word purity politics. Oh, yeah. I've just been trying to figure out um, what, where does it come from that um, folks take a position that they consider to be, a, you know, a, a moral position, but it's not necessarily informed by strategy, right? It's not that they're not right, it's just that they're not gonna win, you know? And, and, I, and I, I feel like there's a one-up or one, one-upmanship that happens in that. And I honestly have a hard time understanding it. And I, I'm just wondering, you know, is it rooted in ego? Is it like, what is that? What is that like wanting to be to the left of the left of the left? Um, yeah. You know, yeah, where does it come yeah. from? And how do we address it in a way that is um, gentle in our movements or like effective? Gentle yeah. yeah, and I would love to hear other people's thoughts on this. I mean, I feel like there is, mm. okay, so this is the, the analogy I'll give. So like, uh, I didn't go to no Ivy League school. I don't have no degree. I'm just like, you know, I went to good old University of Tennessee in Knoxville in Tennessee State and then left because I got sick and was like, I would rather fight deportations than get this piece of paper. So um, that's Elandria's point of view even though my mom is very pissed. Uh, so it wants her piece of paper on the wall. So um, the thing I would say is it reminds me, so I am doing this project called Beautiful Solutions with uh, two people, Rachel and Eli, who are really beautiful. Um, Rachel went to Yale and Eli went to the Vanderbilt. And I was very clear about you where I went to school. Okay, so, um, and they both also went to like really, 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 like some of the best private schools you can go to in the US, like top private schools and like, Rachel's father, granddaddy, right, was the director of the NIH. I mean, these are money people now. I mean, and then there's me. So, not that I'm not smart, but you know, I mean, it is a difference. So when we, we are at it, we are writing a book. How I write is way different than how Rachel and Eli learn to write or edit. So I think about it in terms of editing. So my stuff will always read like somebody from like, this, a southern whatever place that like is smart, but like may not have all the like great this writing skills of all time. But I establish you, everybody can read it. It's understandable because my goal is to write for the fourth grade reading level because that's what's around me. It's people who really have a hard time. But when it came time to editing, people's like, and they've done this forever my whole life, or people I'm around, the red pen just be moving. And they take, they change the words I'm trying to say. I said, they change everything. And then they edit down. They're like, this is so much better. And I'm like, that's not what I was trying to say. I don't like you right now. Right? And like, it caused me to have a bunch of like uh, insecurities and a bunch of stuff around not my, not the, about both what I was trying to say and the writing. Does that make sense? And like what I was, and then I had to like get to a place where they were like, actually, you know more than us about the content. You just did not go through like the Vandy and Harvards and Yales, like kill everything school of editing, right? So like, and so now I tell people when you talk about my stuff, come up with two things you want to change and then stop because I'm not doing all the little micro adjustments. That's how I think about the politics and purity, right? Like we must edit down to have the, this is what it's supposed to look like. Right, like I am the 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 queen, the queen, the the whatever of the politics. The problem is most of those folks are not actually there in terms of their analysis, right? Because if you were, you would know that like there are many knowledges in the world. You sit in a place for what you know, and then the, the second you like, I was just on a panel of these black like women. Dear God, there are so they like these uh, folks at uh, Ashton Ecologica and in the Americas doing work around climate and ecology co are convening 
these like feminists, you like women is ikintros, right? Where they're like inviting some of the top leading people doing work around environment and race and and feminine and like fem to like be like, what is the feminine response to what's going on right now? Like, what is a gendered way of understanding where we have to go? And so their first one was around the intersection of racism, environment, and like where and where we have to go and what are the interventions we have to be. So now I don't know how I ended up on the panel, but I was blessed. So it was me, somebody that was Afro Ecuadorian, somebody Afro Brazilian, and somebody from Haiti, right? I learned a ton. And I mean, I'm around a lot of people, but I was like, whoa, partly because you never hear from black people from Ecuador, right? Like Afro Ecuadorians are like left out of like the whole conversation. And so to like really think about the rights of nature, what that means, what's happening, right? So like, they're like questioning even their work around what they did for the rights of nature in the constitution. We ain't even close. And they're like, what do we not consider? Like, where do we go off course? And when we elected this president, now we have a fascist in office again. What, what happened? Like what happened to go from here to here? Right? Like what's happening in Bolivia? What's happening in all these countries? Like what's going on? What's our analysis of where we messed up? Like we can't even get a leftist president. We ain't got nothing in the constitution about nature. Like we're not even close. And they are like, and deeply interrogating their own work. Right? And like, and, and I feel like that's the thing, but it's not that they're not trying to move another president forward. They're like, we got many options of things to do. But I feel like because most of us are very individualist and like when we have like gatherings, I mean, the difference between a gathering, like, like the difference when I go to union stuff in like Korea, the retail workers out there and they like heels and they make up and they is moving. And they like, we are organized, look good, organize it. We like, oh, you got on the heel. You not down for the calls. You got on the makeup. You actually look cute. That means you are not ready. I'm like, you can look cute and be ready. You ain't got to look bad. What happened? So like, it, we got purity in the sense of like, if you are a healer, you got this part of your hair shaved off, that part there. I mean, we are so performative that part of it is performance. Like, I think most of the things we do is theater. It's great theater. I mean, it's real cute. We is good at performance. So we are doing performative work, mostly. There's some of it that's actual, like deep in, but a lot of it's performative. And we want to go to 92 conferences and we want to like get on the plane and we want to do a whole bunch that is not institution building in our local places. So there's like the people that are actually doing that work in their local places. And a lot of you are them, right? But if you really look at like who gets play in a national landscape, it's a lot of people who are really quite performative and do a lot of traveling and actually haven't built much. Not really. So like I do co-op work and like for a long time who was bidding like lifted up were men who had never built a single co-op. They were starting it and they hadn't been around for longer than two years. And I'm like, I don't want to listen to nobody that ain't done nothing for at least five, six years. Like you have no, like, what is your record? Like what have you done to overcome the problems? Right. And so I feel like that's, but we're really into charisma. And so I think because we're such into charisma and we're such into quotations, and we're such in a performative, it means that I actually, in order to have voice, I have to do this ego lift, and I have to act like this is the only way forward for you to actually go, okay, you're right, right? So then who gets player people who are writing their articles that are about somebody else and these people who are about this thing? And so we just have some work to do, I think, around what it means to actually collectivize and what it means to like be okay giving up whatever, right? So like I got off the speaker circuit for years and just stopped talking. Cause I was like, it's time for other people to talk. Now I talk again a little bit more around real specific things. But I think like people don't want to give up the floor either because the floor is about money, right? Can ego be a part of leverage? Okay, hold on, who asked that? Okay, you got to say that loud. I want to hear you. And say what you mean. What? Can ego be a part of leverage? 
Break it down. When you're up a, you, when you are using for somebody and they're they don't Chris Eagle and they don't recognize you because you don't have your acolyte list there. Mm -hmm. However, you're living the life that they are recommending or recommending yay and nay. Then in that case, can your ego meaning your accomplishments in within the system become a part of leverage positively spiritually and if so my next question then is how do you smooth it in yeah i mean i think of egos are pro i mean i don't think of people's like uh achievements and stuff as ego okay right so I think like I mean you know let's be real people can people do stuff I'm like great right. I mean like I'm so happy like even though I didn't go to school and get all my degrees and everything I love with my young people my young people going to Yale they going to Brown I mean they running like stuff I'm like looking my people right I'm like get it baby so like here's an example so like there's a, a friend of mine Yeshima Ben Milner right yes she one of my former young people she runs data for Black Lives right uh yes she powerful yes she was homeless right so when I met Yeshi. Yes, you homeless, black girl, struggling, trying to figure it out, immigrant parent, immigrant kids, whatever, right? We put all the love in the universe, Dream Defenders, Highlander, and to the yes. I mean, so like, part of the ego is, I'm like, look at my baby, right? Like, and I, every time I'm like, oh, I can't do nothing. Yes, you're like, I, I got you. You ain't got to do this. Like, we got you. We learned. Thank you, right? That's also ego, right? So now I got somebody who can, Literally call AT and T on the phone, right? Like Rashad, you know Rashad Robinson forever in a day, right? And so I'm like annoyed right now with how people doing stuff around disability. It' about to be on. So like I'm like, all right, we're about to get a whole bunch of people. So like, actually, here we go. This best example. What you saying? So good friend of mine, minister, husband. He is third editor down at the New York Times. All right, I met him in Arkansas. He was like regular old dude editor at Arkansas and has shifted over, you know, we've been 15 years time to now third editor at New York Times. Well, I'm like, there are people who've been doing work around disability justice that are black for a long time that get no play. People who are like, uh, not the highlighted people that need play. Well, guess what? Guess who got in the New York Times in the time of the ADA week? All them beautiful people that people don't normally know see, they all made it into the New York Times. Now that people are like, how do we get all this coverage? I'm like, mm -hmm. they don't know that. Don't none of them know I call some people on the phone and say, here's who you need to talk to. Or like call some people on the TV stations and say, call these people. They, that's irrelevant. What they need to know is that they now getting play. I'm not, they don't know, right? I'm not trying to get on the TV. I don't want to be on TV. I want them on the TV though. And so I think part of the thing is, to me, that's leverage. Right? And so it actually changed the conversation around the ADA so we can talk about how horrible the ADA is. Because in the celebration of the ADA, I was like, the ADA sucks. I was like, the damn sidewalk don't even work so I can roll on the sidewalk. So like, please don't talk to me about the celebration of the ADA when I can't get on the sidewalk. Right? And so like, that's the thing, right? And you're talking, like people were talking about, you know, here's the thing that fight we're in struggle with for disabled kids, right? And the special needs kids, I call people disabled, not special needs. But, you know, and I think like what that means to me is, it's, but to me, that's not about necessarily like ego. That to me is about like utilizing the relationships you have to like actually move on. Now, the difference would be is, so uh, someone I work with, their mentor called and said, can you call for me and suggest and nominate me for these awards? And so they got lots of fellowships and awards and bunches of stuff. And they realized they were like, oh, they get at them because they called their former students and said, can you nominate me? And they're like, oh, I mean, they're beautiful people. But you're like, oh, this is how you all get all these awards and nominations. Like, I'm like, how can we even get these things? I don't know. Like, who knows? Right? That's different. Right? Because now it's like, I need validation. And I'm begging, I'm asking you to get validation from my work. Which is different than like, I'm trying to move an agenda so that we can actually move a, a, like an analysis and a politic. And I'm going to use my relationships to do so. That to me is like the difference between my ego 
and like we're doing i hope that makes sense to people and if people disagree i'm really happy to, for you to tell me i disagree i like to have debate too i think it's great i don't think i know what you're saying So I'm curious about what other people think about any of these things. I love to listen to other people talk. It makes me happy. Because y'all brilliant. <laughs> yeah, and I want to also acknowledge that Aaron has joined us. Oh, Aaron, Aaron. Hi, Aaron. Oh, there you go. Hey, hey. Hey, Aaron. We've been talking about can the ego be part of leverage was the last question. <laughs> can and, ego be a part of leverage? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you go about making change? And, you say, say that again. You, say, you work in your local community. <laughs> I didn't hear your question, Danielle. Oh, also, we've been discussing how do you make change uh, and, yeah, uh, purity <laughs> politics. Many things we discussed. I, um, we do, we have about 15 minutes, and I just want to. Um, yeah, we should go in. Yeah, I just want to give Aaron a chance. Uh, we were hoping that you could share your other piece that we didn't get to. And also Absolutely. If there any questions folks have for Aaron or Alondria? About fifteen more minutes. All right, y'all ready? Yeah, please. Yeah. All right, this one is called construction of injustice. Investing in lies and blaming the youth. Ruminate. Murder is designed to hide the truth. Murder is designed to hide the truth. Murder is designed to hide the truth. Five deaths, five deaths in Champaign County jails in less than two years. Inmates beaten and tased by officers slash overseers. Is legal lynching the new scoop? Officer Yort escapes with a history of sexual misconduct and physical evidence of a rape. The response from his friends is political jargon. 13-year veteran Sergeant Myers repeatedly sends 50,000 votes of electricity into detained citizens and is rewarded with a plea bargain. Overcharging persists and it's a damn shame. Obstruction of justice, obstruction of justice, obstruction of justice. Judge Heidi Ladd sentenced Terrell Layfield to six years in prison for giving a false name. Our condolences to the other four men, Marcus Edwards, Joseph Beavers, William D. Marshall, and Quentin Larry, who died on Memorial Day weekend. Abuse of power, malicious prosecution as retribution, all to instill fear. Unequal protection under the law, and the message is clear. We do what the hell we want to do. And the same thing that happened to Amber, Patrick and Kiwan can happen to you. So for those of you who don't believe this piece, pick up your camcorder and start videotaping police. Start tracking their actions on the streets in your community. Do some research and find out how many young females get raped by officers that are on duty. Rodney King and Amadou Diallo are just two of the obvious constructions of injustice. There's a long history of bogus cops receiving slaps on the wrist. Now Champaign County can add four more names to that growing list. But I guarantee you this, at some point, the poor and repressed will get tired of this shit and there will be no respect for authority and no trust in the system. There will be mass civil unrest and everyone will be a victim. Construction of injustice. Now I wrote that probably it's, two, it's 2020. The book was published in 2010. So I probably wrote it somewhere in 2008 or 2009 as we were observing the unrest and as things were just uh, the, the, this piling on of various different injustices and pain. And people are, are they can only take it so long, so long. It's, I guess, sort of my tribute or my version of, um, 
like what Langston Hughes said, what happens to a heavy load? At some point, it's going to sag and it's going to explode. And so that's what, uh, that's what I see, and that's what we've seen happen here now. And it's because of these just piling on injustice after injustice. And that's just in the criminal justice system. That's not accounting, you know, health. Well, I guess healthcare was even a part of this one, as we talk about what happened to the individuals who, uh, who allegedly committed suicide uh, in, in the county jail. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions from anyone. Thank you, Aaron. You're welcome. How about um, you, you said, how do you bring change and make change in your community? It may sound a little cliche, but I promise you it's true. Change you. We all have to do deep introspective work. We talked about this earlier. Uh, you become a different creature and you become um, a different energy and a different spirit in the space. And that's going to affect change uh, within your community immediately. Uh, and then now you, you seek out people who have like minds and like spirits and you all come together and say, these are the things that we're going to work on. Uh, and that synergy is in the room. I know you all learned that at Highlander Folk School. Uh, I learned that you learned it at Highlander Folk School because my mentor told me he learned it at Highlander Folk School. Many of you all may not know that a lot of the civil rights folks, Septima Clark, Reverend Bevel, Martin Luther King, uh, Rosa Parks, they all went to Highlander Folk School with Miles Horton. Right. Uh, so uh, there's a little, little, maybe a little unknown history for folks. And can I ask you a question? Sure. Because I feel like we on the same wavelength. Like, because I feel like it's about <laughs> embodiment, right? Like, that's what I call it. Like, how do we embody the world we want to live in so people see reflected in us who they need to be, right? And I think that mm -hmm. that's why I do you for the way I do it, right? It's like if we embody a whole different ethos, then we move so different. And so I'm curious if you can talk some around like what practices you are using and like what you help people get to. Because I feel like so much of the cultural work is actually about that, right? Like shifting the energy and shifting like the way we see ourselves as worthy. And so I would just yeah. love to hear about some of the work you've been doing around that in a deeper way? So, so this began for me, I've always desired this, but I only found it and saw it promoted as I went through that three and a half years of training through atonement training, where I really got to that space where I could be comfortable with myself and not, not um, have any fear or concern about judgment and retribution. We practiced that. We went through that over and over and over again and created scenarios for individuals to be free and to now investigate where they got these thoughts and things like this from. And so that is the biggest thing for me uh, because I was able to open up and then I saw the beauty of creating that space for other people. We did it in CU Citizens for Peace and Justice. I did it through Speak Cafe all of the different organizations that I come to, that's what I try to bring to the table is to let's create this safe space for us not to judge one another, just address whatever the issue may be and, and help somebody grow if that's what they're trying to do. And that's been the thing that's been the biggest asset, I think, for me personally, and that I think I bring to the table to so any, uh, any work that I do. Thank you. Now, how do I, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Thank, thank you for, for your beautiful poem. I just uh, was really impressed the last time when you were talking about building communities and uh, about, you know, that you always do not get divided. Everybody has to say when they get hurt. And uh, uh, the community try to, tries to deal with it. And I really love that. I think it's so important. I wanted to ask if you could describe or a bit more uh, how can you create that situation to be safe because 
if everybody is there and maybe there are new people coming, not everybody has the capacity to uh, deal with that hurt. So mm -hmm. do you do it like separately or is everybody there and they are uh, getting new experience from, from this case or how, how does the situation can, yeah, is, follows? Uh, so the first thing I, I typically do is to put myself on the chopping block and confess uh, something that maybe people don't know about me or something that happened in my past. I would typically talk about my um, drug abuse, um, womanizing, and um, just various different things. And I would just confess that this is, these, is, these were my thoughts. Um, my growth and development around uh, uh, the... Uh, Let's see, how'd I say it? Basically just evolving period and addressing some of the, the issues that I know other people have wrestled with. So I would just put myself out there first and open up the space and let people see that I'm willing to be vulnerable. Believe me, I get criticized for it. It is not the ideal thing to do now that I'm doing as an elected official. Um, it's more challenging uh, as an elected official uh, but that's one of the things that I do to open up is to tell my story and not be ashamed at all. I'm not ashamed at all of my story. And I try to be vulnerable for the other people. And when they see that, eventually it comes around. Um, it, I think people feel that energy, that safeness, and then they open up. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. I want this to go on forever. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, are there other things people want to ask um, before we close? Go ahead, Mark. I said Mark. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question for both uh, Aaron and Alandria, kind of building off of what you both have been saying the last 20 minutes or so, um, is um, so part of what you're talking, this wavelength you're talking about is working on yourself as part of um, um, how to make, you know, how to make the needed changes. Um, and I got the impression that both of you are people that are able to do that while you're doing public actions and organizing groups and um, getting into it with people. So I'm just wondering <laughs> how you think about that. Am I right? You know? Yes. Uh, so for me, Believe me, some of the people I've been getting into it with lately challenges that uh, that approach. Um, but it's so rewarding, Mark, to me, that moment when I know that I have opened myself up and made myself vulnerable and it has made somebody else feel safe, right? Um, and so even as we're doing the work, uh, I remember one of the, and Mark, you remember the uh, phone contract campaign that we did with Sandra Otten. We were down at the Democratic headquarters with uh, Barbara Wysocki was there, a couple of other Democrats who were waiting to get inside the facility. And Sandra Otten was there with me and, and everybody was kind of drilling them a little bit. And I stopped and I said, Barb, we are aware that you are a mom, a grandmother, uh, a human being, and you have other things to do in this world than to respond to our concerns. And I just want to acknowledge that, that we are aware of that, and I appreciate your service. I'm just trying to get some answers. She said, well, Aaron, that is just the first time I've heard anybody even acknowledge anything like that. And I think it's so much more rewarding when it works like that than when you just force somebody to do something, because we want more than just the outcome. We actually want the new energy. We want that new spirit also to exist in that person. So we can't, I don't think it's as effective to, you know, really uh, berate somebody or challenge their, their character, moral character, and turn around and ask them to, to grow and develop. It's more difficult that way. I mean, and I'm, I'm still guilty of, of chewing people out sometimes, believe me, but um, that's, that's the part of it that's rewarding to me, and that's how I'm able to do it while I'm organizing. 
I would just say I feel like um the thing I feel like I had to really grow into is sharing about the things that have been really harmful. So I feel like uh, I used to never talk about being raped. I used to mm -hmm. never talk about like what happened to me in Palestine and Israel and what it meant to have full body cavity search by fingers of uh, metal detectors and it a lot. Right. And so I literally would talk about nothing like that. I, I, like I didn't talk about my disability ever and like what it meant. Right. I just allow people to say whatever they said because I didn't want to be, uh, I was being judged by it anyway, but just was not comfortable like talking about it until I was in working with a youth crew and people were from Palestine, El Salvador. They had gone through all these things. Right. And they're like, and the adult allies are like struggling, right? The adults can't hold the young people. Like it was a lot, <laughs> you know, and I had to like, and people were being deported and I had to just like, be like, you know what? Now I have to actually share that the person I thought I was going to marry was like, could commit a suicide because they're about to be deported to the worst favela in Brazil. Now I actually have to share about like what it meant for me to be raped because you need to understand it's not just you, right? Like uh, it's happened to many of us and we still here, right? Like it's a struggle, but we here. And I think that mm -hmm. those things as are when I've been the most vulnerable is when in community with people and organizing with people who when stuff happens to us, like, so I'm literally about to do a thing next week with Althea who, um, who people set a fire. The white men set her a fire in Madison. I don't know if y'all remember this. Yeah. Um, well, Andrea, can, I, can I just say something uh, also in yeah. relationship? It's also empowering, yes. right? When you, when you tell that story. Um, and not only do you, you know, you sort of relate to everybody else, but like you said, I'm still here, right? After all of that, I'm still here. And so we can make it through. I think that's the, that's one of the biggest parts of this is that when I tell that story about my drug abuse, other people always come up and say, man, that's, wow, that's, that's my story. Thanks for sharing it. And just that little bit of glimmer of hope for them, I think is, 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 is necessary at that time. And it's, it's a very spiritual experience. Thank you. That's uh, uh, I'm I'm still working on that. <laughs> Thank well, you. We all are. That's for sure. Well, Andrea, you, you you were just saying that you were about to meet with Althea next week, and I just wanted you to finish. Oh that. yeah. Well, I was just gonna say, you know, I think. You know, she's not, like, I've known her since she was, like, 12 and 13. Um, and so when the story hit, I was like, hold up, I know this little girl. What? Hold up, right? It was, like, a really intense thing. And she does not really identify as an organizer. She's just, like, a regular human being, right? Um, and it happened to her. And so she's like, I need support. Like, I need to be around other people who have experienced anything like this because I don't know how to come back. Right, like she's like, I, I mean, I'm trying to come back. I'm trying to be the most whatever I can be. And I have absolutely no clue how to get through this. And her parents are beautiful, but they don't know either, right? Like that's not ever been in their experience, nor did anyone ever think that would happen to somebody in no Madison, Wisconsin, right? And like, you're like, what? And so we're in a really funky moment. And so I think the thing I was gonna say is she was like, I'm reaching out. Can we do a form? Can we talk about like what it means to come back? from these traumatic things that happen and how you still root and love in the midst of the fear and in the midst of the pain and in the midst of the grief. And like, how do I not look at every white dude coming down the street as if they're going to do a thing to me because my brother is a white dude, right? And so I feel like the contradictions that we sit in around trust and around the ability to do atonement and I feel like the thing I think I want to say at the in like the close and just forgiveness is major. I think forgiveness of ourselves and forgiveness of each other and like and forgiveness of our communities and our families, I think is major. And I feel like that's a lot of the work 
It to me, so when I think about the vulnerability, it rests on the fact that I forgive myself for whatever decision I have made and knowing that I will make some stupid ones down the road, right? And I think that to me is like actually the end and to be like, I am okay, <laughs> right? And see, and see, Alondra, this, 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 what you're doing right now, you may not be aware of it, but even, even as people are sort of getting something from me, you're helping me right now. At this very moment, you're helping me. I'm dealing with a situation in the office. I'm frustrated about a mistake that was made. It's causing a whole bunch of riffraff and stuff. But I know I'm, I'm busting my butt trying to do the best that I possibly can. But I made a mistake, right? And there's going to be other mistakes. And so this is why we, we said, hey, listen, you, you can't beat yourself up. And one of the reasons, this is what I was trying to go back to when you were speaking earlier, why we confess also, we learned this through atonement, was I need to know you the best that I can. Because we might have to go sit at a lunch counter and these, these folks want to come and pour hot coffee over our head and stuff like that. I have to know where you are in this. So if you're keeping something from me, maybe I don't know that sending you to this situation is a trigger for you right? Or sending you with the wrong person and y'all distracted off on something else that you ain't got no business doing. So we need to know one another and to be open so we can know each other better and know best how to battle and who to send to what situation. All right, y'all. No, go ahead. Oh, do we have time for one more question or people want to go home. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to ask Alandria, uh, I got really captivated by uh, you talking about uh, the writing and language and it's something which really like interests me because uh, I come from like low educated family and uh, I made it kind of like getting a degree and now I try to you know share things I learned and yeah I just it's really hard to talk to them in a way like my language is constructed differently because I got this this school, so uh, there is no trust. Or so I, I was just like wanted to ask for advice how how to transgress like language differences. Yeah, I mean, and I'm sure Aaron, other people have thoughts. I mean, I feel like a lot of us got families that you know they go nowhere. I mean, I feel like one thing that I will just say that for me was really important is never losing sight of where I came from and always staying connected in, right? And part of that, I got a twin brother who went to nobody's school, who like, school was his like worst thing in history. And so he like, I hate school. And like, we were on two different tracks and he's the twin, right? And so I remember doing workshop at Highlander and he was like, I never came to anything you ever do. So him and my sister-in-law at the time, they came to the workshop, right? And so I was like, okay, we cannot use organizing things around campaigns. We're going to use softball team, right? Like, okay, everybody's formed a team. So we use softball team, church flowers. We use a whole bunch of stuff that's actually the same in terms of organizing. The steps look very similar, but without you having to be like deeply political, done all the things. And so to me, it's about translation and like it's very formed and about like, how do I like just go back and not have to use the 92 big words and just let it go and and just know my goal is for like everyone to feel like they matter. And if I am using terminology that makes you feel like you stupid, we can't be a relationship. Like I just look, and so it's been really a thing for me, right? To be able to still talk to my own brother and still talk to my own aunts who clean houses every day for a living, right? And to also, and this is the other thing I'll say about the trust part. I have learned more from the aunts and uncles and cousins that pick fruit and clean houses around what it means to stay in and what it means to like really like be dedicated than I have most of the people than a lot of which who are the degreed. And so like I am blessed to have all of them in my life around building who I am. And I think the more that we acknowledge the power of like the inherent power of folks that are not degreed up and don't have all the damn words that nobody can understand, then I think like it shifts. But I do think it's hard. I will say it's hard. Like people still, they still trust us. So I do want to just acknowledge everyone in my life whose families have 
uh, less formal education, there's like a major trust thing that's just there. And I think, I think you acknowledging it is huge because it's real. It's just really real. Like the travel stuff is real with my twin, right? It's like, he can't go nowhere and I'm going fuck these and all over the universe. So I just think it's like, it's a thing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know Danielle has to go uh, get a levy passed for her town. <laughs> um, right this very second. Just, uh, just put a wish out there for a half a million dollars for the poor, okay? Yes, 700,000. 750. <laughs> this is great, everybody, because I have to run yeah. as well, but I hope yeah. that, uh, that I'll be back and we can do something like this again. This is definitely, um, I, I put it in the chat, this is revolutionary. Thank you so much, Alondria. Thank you so much, Aaron. Thank yeah, you so much, out. everyone oh, who spoke up and who witnessed and who's here. It's really Enjoy your great. dinner, Alondria. Yeah. Thank you. Great. And good luck, good everybody, everything. Yeah, take care, everyone. Thanks. Bye.